Remarkably, paleoanthropologists are not super clear on when the Neanderthals first began to separate themselves from their own ancestors, but the fossil record tells us that Neanderthals were definitely around by about 300,000 years ago. They mysteriously disappeared around 40,000 years ago, as modern humans first began to move into Europe. However, given the difficulty of interpreting the fossil record, scientists are divided on why these primitive humans no longer walk the earth. Many believe that modern humans outcompeted Neanderthals, eventually leading to the Neanderthal extinction. In the end, you've got one human population that replaces the other, which historically does not happen in a peaceful manner. There is no reason to suspect that ancient humans, whether they be Neanderthals or Homo sapiens, were any less territorial or any less barbaric than we are today. In fact, smashed skulls, spear wounds, and high levels of testosterone evidenced by their extremely thick bones suggest they would be even more prone to conflict than humans of today. Paleoanthropologists find that Neanderthals fell into at least two basic ethnic groups that coincided with their north-south geographical distribution. Southern Neanderthals from the Iberian Peninsula, the Balkans, the Middle East and Italy had broader and shorter faces than northern Neanderthals from populations living north of the Pyrenees, the Alps and Central and Eastern Europe. Southwest Asian Neanderthals were Neanderthals who lived in the Levant and the Middle East and Arabia, the southernmost expanse of the known Neanderthal range. Although their arrival in Southwest Asia is not well dated, early Neanderthals occupied the region apparently until about 100,000 years ago. At this time, Homo sapiens immigrants seem to have replaced them in one of the first anatomically modern expansions into the region. In their turn, starting around 80,000 years ago, Neanderthals seem to have returned and replaced Homo sapiens in Southwest Asia. They inhabited the region until about 50,000 years ago. Southwest Asia Neanderthals have left well-preserved skeletal remains in the Levant and Middle East, but some remains are fragmentary. No Neanderthal skeletal remains have ever been found in Africa, and although there are Middle Paleolithic Levalloy points in Egypt and in the Arabian Peninsula, it is unclear whether these were made by Neanderthals or by anatomically modern humans. Neanderthals living further to the east, such as those found in present-day Uzbekistan and eastern Russia are known as Central and North Asian Neanderthals. For example, a mood one is a nearly complete but poorly preserved adult Southwest Asian Neanderthal skeleton thought to be about 55,000 years old. The cave site has several skeletons, including children, who appear to have been deliberately buried. Usually when skulls have more gracile features, they are suggested to be female, though this skeleton was also quite tall. There are no definitive traits to tell whether this was a tall female or a gracile male because the pelvis was too damaged. Brain volume varies enormously in modern humans, ranging from less than 1,000 to more than 2,000 cubic centimeters, so the largest modern volume exceeds that of any known early human species to date. Of the known fossils, however, one of the largest Neanderthal brain volume estimates is from the 55,000-year-old Amud Neanderthal, at 1,736 cubic centimeters. The mean Neanderthal brain volume figure, 1,410 cubic centimeters is larger than that of recent humans, 1,350 cubic centimeters, but as larger bodies have larger brains, on average, once the heavier bodies of Neanderthals are factored in, any significant difference disappears. Taking into account body size, Homo sapiens does have one of the largest brains proportionately. So we can learn from Neanderthals that size does not always matter, when it comes to brains. With an estimated height of 5 feet 11 inches, a mood one is considerably taller than any other known Neanderthal, and its skull has by far the largest cranial capacity of any archaic hominin skull ever found, making it one of the most well-known specimens of Neanderthal skulls. Like other Neanderthal specimens in the Levant, such as the Shanidar specimens, a mood one skull is long, broad, and intermediate in cranial vault height as compared with European Neanderthals and modern humans. With a supposedly large nose and a big face, a small brow ridge and small teeth, a mood one exhibits an unusual mosaic of features compared to European Neanderthals. Contrary to the majority of other Near Eastern and, especially European Neanderthals, its brow ridges are slender and its chin, though still minimal by modern human standards, is somewhat developed. Although a mood one is considerably taller than any other known Neanderthal, its body is stocky, wide, and has short limbs similarly to the cold-adapted bodies of classic West European Neanderthals. 
Anthropologists initially interpreted these features as intermediate between Levantine Neanderthals and Levantine, anatomically modern humans, including Skull and Kafzer. Indeed, a mood one is highly progressive for a Neanderthal, and has many derived traits shared with early anatomically modern humans and even modern humans. However, the Amud-1 facial skeleton was incomplete and fragmentary, its assumed form has been reconstructed, and hence measurements of the specimen, particularly with regards to the mid-face, are speculatory. However, a recent virtual reconstruction indicated that the Amud-1 facial skeleton was smaller than previously estimated, and that the cranial vault was shorter and more brachycephalic during the individual's lifetime, having been deformed in situ by geological pressure. Shanadar I was an elderly Mesopotamian Neanderthal male who lived around 55,000 years ago, making him a contemporary of Amud I. Shanadar Cave is about 575 miles northeast of Amud Cave. He was aged between 30 and 45 years when he died, remarkably old for a Neanderthal. Shanadar I had a cranial capacity of 1,600 cubic centimeters, was around the height of 5 feet 7 inches, and displayed severe signs of deformity. Due to all of his injuries and side effects of trauma, it was very unlikely that this individual could independently provide for his family, implying he may have been kept alive due to a high status within society or a repository of cultural knowledge. This evidence has led to speculation that the Neanderthals had some sort of altruistic characteristics, with the possibility of the presence of ethos within the Neanderthal community. The discovery of stone tools, found in proximity to these individuals, allows us to deduce that the Neanderthals exhibited enough intelligence to make everyday life easier for themselves. Maybe this knowledge surpasses basic comprehension to include characteristics such as humility and compassion, which have the most known presence in Homo sapiens. These individuals may have had the capacity to show empathy to others, and come to the understanding that life has meaning. This Neanderthal man was armed and dangerous, and the wound that ultimately killed the Mesopotamian Neanderthal was most likely caused by a thrown spear, the kind only modern humans used, but Neanderthals did not. In fact, what we've got is a rib injury, with any number of scenarios that could explain it. But analysis indicates the wound was from a thrown spear, and it appears that modern humans had throwing weapons technology and Neanderthals didn't. Researchers think the best explanation for this injury is a projectile weapon or dart, and given who had those, and who didn't, implies an act of human Neanderthal aggression. Investigators used a specially calibrated crossbow, copies of ancient stone points and numerous animal carcasses to make their deductions. While narrowing the range of possible causes for the Mesopotamian Neanderthal S wound, and raising the possibility of an encounter between humans and our big-headed cousin, the research does not definitively conclude who did it, or why. Furthermore, according to the researchers, putting aside the small biotype species, all documented humans during the early and middle Pleistocene era that inhabited Africa, Asia and Europe seem to have medium and above medium heights for the most part of two millions years. However, the researchers state that amongst every ancient population they have found a tall or very tall individual. In their opinion, this suggests that the height of the human genus remained more or less stable for two million years, until the appearance of a groundbreaking species in this sense, just 200,000 years ago. These were the Homo sapiens, who were initially significantly taller than any other species that existed at the time. The explanation is found in the overall morphological change in the human body biotype that prevailed in our species compared to our ancestors. The Homo sapiens had a slimmer body, lighter bones, longer legs and were taller. Scientists have documented various advantages that made the sapiens biotype more adaptable. These include their thermoregulatory, obstetric and nutritional makeup, but in the eyes of the experts the greatest advantage of this new body type was increased endurance and energy. In fact, larger legs, narrower hips, being taller and having lighter bones not only meant a reduction in body weight including less muscular fat, but a bigger stride, greater speed, and a lower energy cost when moving the body, walking or running. This type of anatomy could have been highly advantageous in terms of survival in Eurasia during the Upper Pleistocene era, when two intelligent human species, the light-bodied Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals, had to face difficult climatic conditions, drastic changes in ecosystems and ecological competition. Cro-Magnon populations of early Homo sapiens date from the Upper Paleolithic period, 40,000 to 10,000 years ago, in Europe. 
In 1868, in a shallow cave at Cro-Magnon in southwestern France, a number of obviously ancient human skeletons were found. He human bones found in the topmost layer proved to be between 10,000 and 35,000 years old. The prehistoric humans revealed by this find were called Cro-Magnon, and have since been considered, along with Neanderthals, to be representative of prehistoric humans. Modern studies suggest that Cro-Magnons emerged even earlier, perhaps as early as 55,000 years ago. Cro-Magnons were robustly built and powerful and tall. The body was generally heavy and solid, apparently with strong musculature. The forehead was straight, with slight brow ridges, and the face short and wide. Cro-Magnons were the first humans to have a prominent chin. The brain capacity was about 1,600 cubic centimeters, somewhat larger than the average for modern humans. It is thought that Cro-Magnons were probably fairly tall, compared with other early human species. It is difficult to determine how long the Cro-Magnons lasted and what happened to them. Presumably they were gradually absorbed into the European populations that came later. Even with complete genomes, scientists are unable to pinpoint the pattern of skin, hair and eye color in ancient groups such as the Neanderthals. Nonetheless, most of us had a good idea of how the genotypes would look. Neanderthals should have many of the genes associated with light pigmentation in modern people. According to anthropologist John Hawkes, for almost a century, scientific artists have shown ancient hominins with the same coloring as modern individuals living in the same region of the planet. Almost every artist who has envisaged Neanderthals in their natural habitat has depicted them with pale skin color, comparable to that of modern Europeans. They also hypothesized that the Neanderthals' hair and eye color range would have been similar to that of today's Europeans, that is, Europeans who lived and worked outside with natural tanning. Fewer painters have painted Neanderthals from the Levant and other portions of Central and Western Asia in their natural habitat. Nonetheless, those few have painted Neanderthals with dark hair and medium light skin tones akin to peoples of Western Asia today. Illustrators and artists have expressed the views of their era's scientists. Most have assumed that natural selection has optimized the level of pigmentation in today's humans, allowing them to adapt to their local environments. The primary reason that populations nowadays differ in skin pigmentation is that they live in areas with varying levels of exposure to UV radiation from the sun. Lighter populations can be seen at higher latitudes, where ultraviolet radiation levels are lower. Most anthropologists now agree that the range of pigmentation in live individuals represents a trade-off between the various impacts of ultraviolet light on humans. Thus, experts believe that if light pigmentation was beneficial for survival and reproduction in modern Europeans, it would have been equally beneficial for Neanderthals living in the same areas. Generally, scientists and artists make the same assumption about ancient relics all across the world. Ancient fossils from equatorial Africa have been recreated with dark skin, hair, and eye pigmentation, but the Denisovans, who were largely known from genetic data discovered in Central Asia, have been portrayed with coloring comparable to modern people in northern China and Mongolia. Now it's past time to start shifting the goalposts. An honest examination of the morphology of Neanderthals from Palestine and Syria who lived between 80,000 and 50,000 years ago, reveals that they differ significantly from European Neanderthals. Until now, the contrasts have been centered on the disparities between these skeletal materials, and the apparently modern skeleton remains from Skul and Kafzeh caves, which date from 120,000 to 90,000 years ago. Yet, as with early modern human remains from Africa, the early modern sample from the Levant contains a high proportion of traits observed in archaic humans and the Levantine Neanderthals have a high proportion of non-Neanderthal traits. It was always too simplistic to think of this demographic history as an alternation of two binary populations. Nonetheless, the genuine tale has to be more complicated. It will be fascinating to discover more about the morphology of the population that a mood one belonged to. Its anatomy suggests a link between the upper Paleolithic Neanderthals of Europe and the Homo sapiens of North Africa two examples with some anatomical similarities. What's more, the possibility of migration of modern humans from the Levant into North Africa and Europe, or elsewhere into West Africa, is quite intriguing.